a little while back, I looked at the official Bitwarden CLI client, and if I'm being nice to it, it was an absolute train wreck. I wouldn't recommend anyone going and using the official version because what it basically was was a lightweight wrapper around the JSON API to do things like adding a new password. You had to send this massive JSON object back, which made absolutely no sense. Why it didn't have options, I don't know. So when I made that video, a couple of people suggested another application by the name of RBW. What does the R stand for? Well, it probably stands for Rust, because this is written in Rust, so it is Rust Bitwarden. Even in its current state, it is so much better than the official CLI tool, and with a couple of extra additions to it, there would be no reason to ever use the official version until they actually make it have a decent interface. So like with last time, I'm going to be using my burner account because honestly, I'm too lazy to censor it, and I know that I'm probably going to make a mistake. So let's go and say list out all of the entries inside of my vault. So RBW list, and now it's going to prompt us for a password. Now, the first time you run this, this prompt won't actually appear because you will need to go and put your email address in the configuration. But once it is in there, then you will get this prompt from that point on. So let's go and log into the vault. And you won't have to go and enter that every single time you go and try to do some command. It will start up a session for you by default. It will automatically log out after an hour. But at any point, you can go and lock the vault. These aren't the usernames associated with the passwords. These are the names you've actually given to that password entry inside of the vault. So in this case, I've got item name, test login, and hello. So let's say I want to go and get the password for hello. So rbw get and then hello. And that'll go and print out that password. If we want the one for, say, test login, we can go and do that like that. Now, one advantage of having that password in a separate pin entry rather than actually writing it out inside of your terminal is now you don't have that data being stored inside of your terminal history. So if you accidentally go and upload it to GitHub and you still have it in there or someone else just, you know, presses up a couple of times on your terminal, they won't then suddenly go and see your password. Same with this one right here. We don't have to go and actually put any private information to get the password back out. And if someone tries to run this when the password vault is actually locked, then they won't be able to get anything from it. Now, that was just the password for the account, but if you have, say, a authenticator code also attached to it as well, if you want to get that, you can run RBW code and then the account you actually want to get it for. So let's get the one for hello, for example, and this one doesn't actually have a code assigned to it. This leads us into the first problem, and that is that the application is designed specifically in the mind of the person who actually made it, rather than being as a generic tool. So there's no way, that, at least that I've seen, to actually get out the username. So you can't do something like uh, get username or username or something like that. So you can only get the password and get the code. I don't know why exactly it's made like this. That seems like a really weird thing to just neglect adding. But it's not the last time you'll see throughout this application that random things like that just seem to be missing. Now, the official CLI client seemingly has no design actually put into it, and the author recognized this as well, and he explained why he actually made this application. What he said is that the official application requires passing around temporary keys through the form of environment variables or passing them as extra options to the command. And this is really inconvenient, as well as obviously being very insecure. And to basically avoid this being the problem, RBW manages these keys inside of a background process similar to something like SSH agent and GPG agent, which makes it very easy to work with this across multiple terminal instances. That's enough explanation. Let's go and add a new user into the database. So to do that, we can use the RBW add command. And if we go and run that with the help option, you'll see a couple of things you can actually do. So let's go and run rbw add, and we'll give it a name. So the name is going to be uh, test1, and then we can assign a username to it as well. We'll call the username Brody, for example, and let's just go and run this. Now, the password for this is going to be the first line in the file, and this editor is going to be defined by whatever your editor variable is set to. So let's go and set the password to this is a password. And then every consecutive line after that is going to be stored inside of the notes section. So note 
uh, whatever. We'll just put a bunch of junk in here. And let's go and save this now. And give that a second. It should go and add it to the vault. So if we go and run RBW list again, we'll see we now have a new one in here called test1. RBW get test1. As we can see, that is the password. However, if you're using something like Bitwarden, you probably don't want to write your passwords out by hand. And that is where the RBW generate option comes in. So for this one, the minimum thing we have to provide is how long we want the password to be. So let's say 50 characters, for example, and it will go and generate a 50 character long password. And by default, it's going to have all of the complicated things enabled. So having things like numbers and upper and lower case and symbols. And you can go and disable parts of this if you do want to. I just don't really see any reason to do so. If you want to, though, you can go and use no symbols, non-confusables, and only numbers. Now, only numbers, I wasn't really sure about the point for, but I was thinking that if you want to generate a pin number, this one actually could be useful. The problem I have with these is there's no consistency in the way they're actually named. So, no dash symbols, non, no space, confusables, only numbers. Stick with one style and go with it. I don't really see the point of passphrases inside a Bitwarden, but we can go and generate them as well. And that is done with a really weirdly named option. That is the dash dash diceware option. And this does have to be before the options and the length is going to be the number of words to actually use. So let's go and use say 10 words. And as we can see, that is what it's going to generate. And the separator is always going to be a space separator. There's no way to actually configure that. Now we can generate a password and also go and make a new entry as well. And that is pretty simple. So RBW generate. And then from this point, we need to include the length that we want to make it. So let's go and make it 50. This time we're not going to do a passphrase. Then we have to include the name of the entry. So uh, password test, I guess we'll call it, and then we have to go and set the username. So I'm going to make the username, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter because we won't actually see it, and let's go and generate this. So it's going to go and output the password, but it's also going to go and make a new entry for us. So rbw list, as we can see, password test is right here, rbw get, and then password test there is the exact same one we saw here. Now, it probably shouldn't output this to the terminal. It should probably just go and make the actual user and be done with it, but that's how it works. We can also go and edit a password as well. So RBW, edit, and then the name of the entry we want to use. So let's go and use, say, hello, for example. And let's go and, I don't know, get rid of, yeah, this, this half of it. Go and save it. It's going to go and update the entry. And if we go RBW, get hello, as we can see, now it has the shorter password. As with before, those extra lines can also be used to add notes to the password entry as well. Now, I'm not really sure when you would use this, but we also have an RBW history option as well, which lets you see the password history for any of the entries inside of the database. So let's go and look at the one for hello, for example, because we know we just changed that. And at this time right here, it had this password here, and then when we go and change the password again, the password we just set before would then be in this list. Now, because I'm done with this user, let's go and get rid of it. So we can go and run rbw remove, and then the name of the entry. So in this case, it's going to be hello, and make sure you are certain about which one you want to remove, because it won't go and confirm anything for you, it's just going to automatically go and do it. We can also go and, I guess, specify more accurately what one we do want to remove. So let's say we have two of them named hello, but one of them has a different username. We can then go and actually include a second value in here. So let's say we wanted to get hello with the username Brody, for example. And in this case, it can't actually find anything like that. But if there was something there, it would then only remove that one and not the other one. Now, to ensure the application is running quicker and not waiting on the Bitwarden service to just do these simple operations, you will actually maintain a local copy of the database. And if you want to go and get rid of that copy, all you need to do is go and run the rbw purge command. This won't go and affect any of your passwords, assuming that all of your passwords are actually synced with the remote database. All it's gonna do is remove your local ones. And when you do actually do this, it will also log you out of Bitwarden as well. So do keep that in mind. If you are ever unsure if your vault is actually logged in, what you can go and do is run the rbw 
unlocked command with ed on the end and that will actually go and check that now because it succeeded that means the vault is actually unlocked let's go and actually lock the vault with the rbw lock command and rerun the same command again and as we can see, the agent is locked. That basically just means the vault is locked. And we can then go and unlock the vault with the unlock command or any of the commands that actually require access to the database. Now, the setup process is fairly simple, but the first thing you should probably go and run is the rbw config show command, which is going to show you everything you can set and obviously what values they're currently set to. The only thing in here you really need to mess with is the email. Everything else is perfectly fine at their default value. So to actually go and set that, what you can do is rbw config set and then the value you want to set. So email and then the value you want to set it to. So I'm going to set it to something garbage like say this right here. And if we go and run the previous command again, as we can see, the email is now set to that. Now, the base URL is what Bitwarden server to actually connect to. By default, it's going to connect to the main one. If you don't know what you're doing and don't have one set up, just leave that at null. The identity URL is the same thing, but for the identity server, once again, if you're not running your own, just don't bother touching it. One thing you may want to touch is the lock timeout. So this is going to be in seconds, and this is how long to wait to actually do an auto lock. By default, it's set to 3600 seconds, which is 60 minutes, but maybe you want to have it at 10 minutes or 5 minutes, in which case just go and set it to that value. And then the pin entry is the application we'll be using to actually enter our password. By default, it's set to pin entry, and if you're using the GNU tools, you will have pin entry installed. It's one of the default applications. One of the many you probably have no idea about, but it is going to be there. So if you're not using them, uh, I guess there's going to be some alternative you'll have to find instead. Now, I'm not really sure why usernames have sort of been neglected out of this application, because if they were there, this would be such a better application, because... I don't know about you, I don't use the same username and same email on every single service I use, and I want to know which one I actually have associated with that specific password. That seems like a really useful piece of functionality to me. You can search with usernames, but not editing them or getting them. I don't really understand what the deal is there, but I don't expect the author to ever actually fix this because he says that the application is feature complete, and because of that, it makes it much harder for me to actually recommend for someone to use. We sort of have two extremes here. On one side, we have the official Bitwarden CLI client, which is incomprehensibly difficult to use for seemingly no reason, but does basically everything you could ever want to do with Bitwarden. And then on the other side, this is a really simple application to use. It has you know, the standard sort of design you'd expect from a CLI application, but it's missing some basic features that you really would expect to be there. I don't really know which one to recommend. I think ultimately, no matter what you want to use, if you're using Bitwarden from the command line, you're pretty much just losing. Let me know what you think about this application in the comments section down below. I know there's a couple of people who watch this channel who actually do use RBW, so let me know why you use RBW. So I think that's going to be everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, the Stephen, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, there will be links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey and BitChute if you like to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's everything for me, and I'm out.